everybody. Welcome to the weekly Route Consultant webinar. Uh, for those of you who are here for the first time, who've never been to one of these, my name is Josh Gregory. I am the director of our consulting and training team here. Uh, for our regular attendees, for everybody who comes every week, welcome back. But whether you're brand new, this is the first time you've ever seen it, or you come to these every week, or you've been a contractor since the RPS days, you've been here for decades, uh, we want these webinars to be places where you can learn, have a little bit of fun, and then help get all of your questions answered. We'll try to get to as many as we possibly can at the end of the webinar today. And just generally, the way the content will go, um, I'm going to go over a few updates and bring on my co-host in a little bit, and then we will jump in and open it up to a Q&A where you'll be able to answer any of your questions. Uh, but before we get to that, I have a, a quick little disclaimer that I have to read as I do every week. Uh, Route Consultant is not endorsed by and is not recommended by Federal Express Corporation, FedEx Ground, or Amazon. Route Consultant is not sponsored by, is not approved by, is not associated with, and has no connection whatsoever with Federal Express Corporation, FedEx Ground, or Amazon. Uh, now, all that means is that we're not going to be sharing any uh, non-public information here, any materially non-public information, uh, but we do hope that there's lots of helpful information that we can provide for you today. Uh, and as a quick reminder for everybody, our last virtual investor summit of the year is coming up on December 27th and 28th so that it is virtual. You can do it from wherever. And it's our last summit of the year. Uh, and it's basically designed to be a crash course in everything we can possibly teach you in two days. Um, and so if you're on the fence about the FedEx industry and still trying to decide whether or not you want to enter in and pursue a listing in 2023, that's what that event is designed for, is to try to teach you and help you make that final decision. So like I said, last one of the year, December 27th and 28th, and it's virtual, so you can attend wherever you are. Uh, now, if you've been here before to one of these webinars, you know we have a weekly tradition. So when we get to the Q&A, first off, quick note, when you're typing your questions in, uh, put it in the Q&A button at the bottom. If you put it in the chat, I'll miss it. So make sure you put it in the Q&A button. But more importantly, before you type in your question, you first have to answer our question. So the question of the week this week is, what is a book that you own, but you've never read? Um, and I don't need to hear that it's your entire bookshelf. I, I only need one, you don't have to shame yourself. So just give me one book that you own and have never read. And uh, Butch and I will answer that too when we get to the Q&A and then we'll open it up. So when you're typing in your question, make sure you answer that question first. Now, uh, before I get to the updates and content for today, just quickly wanted to go over a few new listings that are on the site this week. So in the pickup and delivery side, we have one in South Carolina. It is seven routes and it's for $425,000. It's got a manager, three spare trucks, four spare drivers, and it's a, a high mileage rural route. So um, if that's the type of business you're looking for, that's what the new one we have on the PND side. Again, it's in central South Carolina. Now we've also got two line haul listings. The first is in central Alabama and it's three line haul runs for $250,000, uh, two dedicated solo runs, one on a signed solo run. It also has a manager, which is pretty rare to see at that small of a size of business. So that's great if you're trying to get in line hall for the first time and it's run remotely right now. So it's not something where you have to be there present all the time. Now, the last listing we have this week is a little bit different. Uh, so it's 18 line hall runs and it's $2.75 million. Um, but this is not a FedEx listing actually. So this is an independent line hall operation. It's not affiliated with FedEx or Amazon. Uh, but it's basically a long-term business that's been operating for 25 years, two managers, 18 dedicated runs. So um, you'd be taking over the pre-existing infrastructure. So it's a little bit different than the types of businesses we're normally listing here. But it is, if that's the type of thing you're interested in, reach out to the team. We can get you more details on that one or on any of the other two that I mentioned today. Uh, so that's it for the new listings today. So it was those three. So um for basically some updates today. Um, so for those of you who are not contractors, we are right in the middle of the peak holiday season. So um, if you are on the webinar right now and you are a contractor, first off, I appreciate you taking the time at one of the busiest times of the year to be on here and with us. So thank you for that. Um, but I, I would assume a lot of people who are here today are not contractors because of how busy it is right now. Um, and so for everyone who isn't aware, these next few weeks are the absolute busiest time of the year in this industry. We're talking deliveries are going to increase 
by 30%, 50%, sometimes even 100% for some territories over these next few weeks. So you're often doing you know, double the number of packages that you would normally do in the normal part of the year. Now, if you have been coming to these webinars all year, or if you have just been following the industry in the news, you'll know that there have been some tough things this year that have happened. Uh, whether it's related to fuel prices or supply chain issues or contract challenges with FedEx or any number of things that you've been, you might have heard about. It has been a tough year in some respects. And the recent concern was that the economy would be so down and that this would be a really slow peak season and a really light Black Friday as well. Uh, so what I want to talk about today is there was actually a report that came out yesterday that showed that this was a record-breaking Black Friday with $9 billion in online sales, the highest it has ever been before. Um, it was also an, uh, an all-time high for online sales on Thanksgiving the day before at about five and a half billion. So it's, and that's still about double the normal day and the normal, the normal sales on a normal day during the year. So uh, what that means is that, you know, there, there could be overall slowing that happens somewhere in the economy, but e-commerce is still alive and well. Um, and the, the important thing to note, we talk about this all the time, but there's still only about 20, 27% of all sales, all purchases are done online. So 73% of those purchases are still happening in store. So there is still a lot of room for e-commerce to continue to grow. Uh, and I know that at my house in particular, and I'm sure a lot of yours as well, um, 98%, 99% of our shopping is done online, uh, because, I see the FedEx delivery driver or the Amazon driver at my house every single day. I don't know what the boxes are. My wife just sent me a picture from our front stop. We've got about 10 boxes on our porch right now. Um, so it is it is definitely a thing where e-commerce is more than 27% in my household. Um, and it's one of those things where it's a con convenience factor and our economy continues to shift in that direction. And the good thing about this industry is that investing in FedEx is a pure e-commerce play. Now, I don't know if you know e-commerce is going to get up to 30% or 50% or more of all purchases, but it's not going to stop at 27%. And that is really positive news for those in the industry already. So all the current contractors looking forward to what the industry can be. And it's also really positive for those looking to get into it for the first time, thinking about the long-term runway of an investment right now. Now, the other kind of uh, you know news that people are talking about, and it's just been kind of a prevalent point of conversation recently, is you know will there be a recession? How uh, much of an impact is gonna, that going to have? Uh, now, you know, I obviously do not have a crystal ball. I can't go into the future to say whether or not a recession will occur or how big of an impact it'll ultimately have on the economy. But what I do know is that our industry is uniquely positioned to benefit from a recession. Now, if you think about it, recessions are basically economic events where the weakest companies are going to struggle and die off. And if you think about it, what is the weakest thing right now? Uh, and that's brick and mortar retail. There is no chance that I would be convinced to start up a retail business in a strip mall right now and try to convince buyers to come out and purchase in my brick and mortar store. Uh, you know, we all know COVID changed a bunch of preferences, and there's still all kinds of flu and COVID and RSV running around this winter to keep people indoors and ordering online. And that just also matches the way that the economy is already shifting towards e-commerce and online sales. Now, when those businesses do end up closing in the event of a recession, those sales will most likely trans transition to online sales. Most of them will. And that is a huge benefit for our business. Um, it, it is one of the great things about this industry where we move counter to a lot of the negative cycles that happen in the economy. So that's one of the nice solidifying um, you know, things about our industry that people use to diversify their portfolio is that we do move counter to a lot of those negative cycles. So, uh, you know, there may be negative news you've heard all year, but I just wanted to make sure that I brought some good news to you today about Black Friday and the future of the industry. Um, our goal here always is to be upfront, to tell you when things are good, to tell you when they're bad. Uh, but regardless, the goal here is to help you make good strategic decisions, no matter what the environment looks like. So I, before we get to the Q&A, 
I'm going to bring Butch Butler on. So he is a sales director here who has been in and out of deals longer than anyone else at the company. So I wanted to bring him on today to just give some quick insight from what he's seeing in the market today and how you all can make decisions and prepare around that. So Butch, do I have you? Yep, I do. Hey, Butch. You. Hey, Josh. How are you, sir? I am doing well. So just as a, a quick way of getting started, um, what have we heard recently from contractors about how this peak season is going? Any of the changes that people have experienced, good or bad? How's that going so far? Well, as you mentioned, peak got off to a pretty good start, which I think was a little bit of a surprise. There was <laughs> some skepticism in the contractor community about what peak was really going to look like. And uh, when FedEx rolled out, FedEx Ground rolled out the Schedule K's. Um, I think the first thought was we're never going to hit these thresholds. And one of the things that we've seen actually is FedEx come back and lower some of those Schedule K thresholds, which is a, really a move in the right direction in terms of them trying to compensate contractors fairly during peak. Um, and so that's a really big plus. Not only is the volume showing up, but FedEx has shown a little bit of leniency around moving Schedule K thresholds for contractors as well, too. So two pieces of really good news there. Yeah. And for those of you who may not know what a Schedule K is, that's basically every year around peak season, FedEx will come around and um, basically have you sign a Schedule K that'll dictate your payment during peak season. And they'll set thresholds that if you deliver over that threshold, you'll get paid in an additional amount. And so what we've seen is that, you know, a lot of contractors were worried that they were never going to hit those thresholds, never get that extra payment. But like Butch said, we, we have heard a lot of positive things about people going over the threshold and even more, what's even honestly more surprising than anything else is that FedEx basically came and said, you know, we're going to lower those thresholds some for people, um, you know, based on volume expectations. But that's a really positive thing that they've done for the community because it basically allows people to make more money and kind of accurately portray the projections and the volume. And so, you know, it, it would be completely uh, possible for FedEx to just say, you know, we won't change the thresholds. And that's, you know, if you go over it, great, you'll get paid more, but otherwise you won't. But they didn't. So that's, that is a really positive thing to see them do. Um, now, it, I think there was something else around Schedule L. Have you seen anything positive there recently either? And can you give a, a quick overview of what that, what Schedule L even is? Sure, absolutely. And you can jump in here too. But Schedule L basically is something that, that FedEx Ground rolled out. It, it, it started with a three-year look back at the history of each individual contractor and their record relative to safety, in particular safety. And um, they looked back at historical accidents and accident claims, what was preventable, non-preventable. And then they assessed you essentially a fine, for lack of a better word, um, to help them recoup for some of the losses that they incurred from those accidents. And as you all probably know, all of us contractors, we operate under FedEx's DOT number. And so they're ultimately responsible for most of, of, the, of the accidents that occur um, above a certain, certain threshold. So when they first rolled that out, it included a three-year look back at, at each individual business. And after taking some feedback from the contractor community, which I think is extremely positive, um, they, they heard that feedback and they came back and adjusted that look back period to 12 months instead of three years. And, and that is a significant change for contractors in terms of looking back at the accident and safety history of their businesses, because a lot of the technology that FedEx contractors now employ in their businesses frankly, was not mandated nor even available three years ago when some of these accidents were occurring. So it's a much more accurate representation of what the businesses look like with the newer and mandated technology from a safety perspective. Um, for most everybody, that resulted in, in those payments and fines being way less than they would have been. Um, and so that's just one of another incremental positive change that FedEx is making um, as they take feedback from the contract community about their, these schedules. And Schedule L was, was a big change when they rolled that out. That's absolutely right. Yeah, because there, there was lots of, uh, I'd say, dissatisfaction is a kind way to, to say when Schedule L rolled out. And so it is really positive to see any change in the direction that feels more fair and more accurate for what these contractors, their safety records actually look like. And importantly for new investors, people entering into this space, if you were to buy a business in this space, you do not inherit an accident history um, with the industry, with the business you're buying. Even if that business had a relatively poor safety track record, you start brand new again to the extent that you're not buying the stock of that business, you're buying the, the assets, which is what we almost always recommend. Um, you get a fresh start. And to the extent you can operate your business 
well from for 12 months going forward without issues around safety and accidents, then you can even be in a position to start collecting money from FedEx because you're operating your business very safely. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So it's, you know, you will get to start fresh and start to build that record up yourself. So that's positive as well. So uh, I know one of the big things we've seen this year is that there have been, you know, earlier and even even last year, some there were some challenges around the labor market and around truck availability. Have we seen any changes there? The labor market really in particular started to, to loosen up a little bit and become easier to hire around the summertime. Um, and so midsummer and as we've gone into the holidays, I have not heard a lot of people complaining about finding qualified workers for peak, um, which was a little bit of an issue last year, um, as well as as rentals and the availability of trucks. And, you know, it's, it's gotten easier from that side of it, too, not only with peak, but just generally running the business for getting a hold of trucks. So I think both of those, Josh, we're starting to see easing a little bit on the pressures that contractors faced over the last 12 months. Yeah, that's right. There's, you know, there's definitely going to be pockets where maybe recruiting is a little bit more difficult just because of the part of the country. But as a general trend, we have seen easing and softening in both of those areas. So that's, that's been really positive to see as well. This time last year, I, I could not say the same. So it's good to see. Even six uh, months ago, the hiring yeah. environment was different. Yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly right. So just as a last thing before we open it up to Q&A, you know, we've got a lot of new investors who are on this webinar. What should people be focusing on right now to help prepare them to make an offer as we look into either the end of this year or the beginning of next? This is a perfect time to do as much prep work. And, and I say prep work in terms of getting yourself ready to buy one of these businesses as you can find. As you all know, FedEx generally is not going to let these businesses trade hands during November and December, unless it's a line haul specific transaction. But this is a perfect time to prepare yourself, not only by analyzing businesses, but by doing some of the things that'll separate you as a buyer. Um, some of these things, we refer to them as the four pillars, but it really does as a new investor, put you in a different position than other people if you've gone ahead and created a corporation. If you've, if you've gone ahead and taken our asset purchase template and shown it to your attorney and, and had changes made ahead of time, so you have a purchase agreement that you're really ready to work with. Um, if you have an RFI done and you've done your education to get up to speed to be able to create that RFI, when you're on a buyer-seller call and you're trying to, to, to make an offer later on a business, you're going to stand out as someone that that seller wants to work with because you've gone through the process of creating your corporation, getting your education in place, getting your RFI prepared. These are the first things we talk to our consulting clients about accomplishing when they join the program. And it really separates them and, and gets them in a position to operate quickly compared to the rest of the universe of buyers. Yeah, and, and that's right. Yeah, so the, we have a, for those who aren't aware, um, you know, you can always enter this space on your own. You don't, you don't even necessarily have to go through a broker, but we have free content, but we also have a consulting program that's designed to kind of walk and guide all of our buyers through the process all the way up to a close to make sure you are as prepared as you possibly can be. So things like those four pillars will help you do, help you accomplish and help you get you know set up to be one of the best buyers for any opportunity. So that's what Butch was referring to there. You know, you sometimes might have heard it called the white glove service, acquisition support, lots of names out there. But yeah, um, those if there's anything you can do right now, while deals aren't necessarily closing, it's trying to make sure you are as qualified and prepared as you can be so that when you make an offer, it will look very good to the seller, help it move quickly, but so that you can get started at the beginning of next year and get moving quickly. The other thing I'll say, Josh, and I don't mean sorry to interrupt, but about the consulting program, and, it, and it, it's real, I tell people this all the time, is the cost of the program is $8,500. And, and it really is designed to take you from this webinar or that initial call till the time you stand up and own a business. And I mean it seriously, and I, I tell people this all the time, it's true. The, the cost of the consulting program pays for itself over time with the two things. One, the deal that you ultimately strike will be way better if you have the knowledge of the consulting program. So the business you buy will be the right business. The deal you strike to buy that business will be a better deal. And I, this is also serious is that the cost of the program is way less than some of the mistakes I've seen people made who tried to stand up without learning how to do it. And the amount of money that they sunk into the process that was unnecessary just by making little mistakes was way more than they would have ever paid us to help them. Um, and so it's, it, it's one of these things that if you're serious about entering the space, you will do yourself a service to get some help and do it right so you don't make costly errors. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's ultimately what this is. What's what these webinars are. It's what our consulting program is designed around is we have made tons of mistakes, seen all of the mistakes a contractor can make. And we're just trying to help you avoid those so that you can enter this space and become successful contractors. And hopefully we'll see you at the expo where we can all get together and celebrate every July. And I don't know if it's luck or what, but I've worked with Spencer longer than most anybody. So I've had the chance to do probably more of these deals than anybody. Yeah. And and probably two thirds to three quarters of all of the transactions that, that we've completed that I've helped with have been with our consulting clients. And the reason is, is because they separate themselves as the best and most qualified buyers. And anytime we're in a situation where there's a competitive buyers that are operating to buy a business, the consulting clients stand out far and above anybody else and the sellers recognize it. So, you know, that it, it, it's not lip service to say that this does help you get ready because I see it in practice all the time. All right. So um, we are about to open it up to, to open Q&A. Now, um, as a reminder, I already see some questions coming through. For us to answer your question, you first have to answer ours, which is um, what is a book that you own and have not read? So Butch, you can answer that first and then I'll answer and then we'll get to the Q&A. Okay, well, <laughs> for me, it's The Grapes of Wrath, okay? Oh. And I've had that book forever. <laughs> I don't even know if a grape can have wrath, uh, but I'm interested to find out what kind of wrath a grape can have and I got to read the book to find out. It is a good book. That is, is, that is a good book, Butch, yeah. But I haven't read it in a long time. Yeah, that was one of those I read when I was younger and was better at reading books. Um, <laughs> the... Uh, for me, there's this book called House of Leaves that I have started at least three times and can't get past about halfway. It is this crazy book about uh, uh, someone who finds like this video of a, a family that lived in a house. And so there's like the, the story of the video, the story of the person watching the video and someone who has found the manuscript. And it's like, by the middle of the book, the person writing it has gone insane. There's like words upside down. You have to read it in a mirror. And every time I get there and think it's an interesting book and then I have to hold the book up to a mirror, I'm like, I, I, I just don't have the patience for this. But it's up there is like, I know this is an interesting thing that I wish I could accomplish, but I can't do it. Yeah, so that's the one for me. And I don't think I ever will, but it's going to sit there forever and remind me. <laughs> All right, so we're going to get to the Q&A. So the first one here is from Terrence. Um, I think it. I think you meant uh, Diary of a, a Whining Kid. I, I, I have not heard of that, if that's the actual one. It could be a wimpy kid, Diary of a Wimpy Kid. It could be. That's that's one. Okay, actually, and then Terrence didn't put in a question. He just wanted to make sure we knew the book he hasn't read. Um, the uh, Okay, so um, the first question is actually from Thomas. You didn't answer the book question, but I'll forgive you and I'll read your question for now. Uh, so, uh, and you can answer this one, but does line haul, does uh, operating a line haul run require a CDL? No, to be an authorized officer of, for, and to own a line haul business, you do not need to have your CDL. Um, your drivers will all need to have their CDLs, but you do not need to have one and you do not need to drive. Yeah, that's that's the important thing. If, if you're a driver, you definitely have to have it. There's a you know, a rigorous um, a number of steps you have to go through, even to go through the CDL school and then to have FedEx experience. But to own a business, you don't have to have one unless you plan on driving. You obviously still can't drive if you don't have your CDL. Um, next one here is from uh, Katina. There's your book. I see it. Okay. Uh, the Light We Carry by Michelle Obama. I haven't read that one either. Um, so she has a few different ones. So I'll go through. First, can you operate in multiple cities? Yes, you can operate in, in as many terminals, stations as, as you would like. Yeah. And the, the kind of the important thing there is something called scale, which if you haven't heard of it, basically in the pickup and delivery space, you can only be uh, a certain, there's going to be a certain percentage that you cannot or own more than that of a terminal. So a terminal will say you can't be more than 10% of this terminal. So um, you can be up to 10% of that terminal, but you can also be up to the scale limit at every terminal in the country. So there's no limit on how many you operate in when it's pickup and delivery. You just can't be above the scale at a particular terminal. And then when it comes to line haul, it's a little bit different. There's basically 26 different districts in the US and you can only be up to uh, a certain number of line haul runs in each district. 
So line hauls more of kind of a regional scale as opposed to pickup and delivery, which is at the terminal level. But regardless, you can still operate out of multiple cities as long as you're in within guidelines for both of them. Um, now, her follow-up question is, is the only way to get into the business to purchase a route from a current contractor? That is not the only way to get into the business. Um, there is a program through FedEx Ground called Build a Ground Biz. Um, it is much different than buying a business. <laughs> and so I know it sounds enticing to, to not have to pay for a business, but when you buy a business, you not only get the exclusive rights to the CSA, you get the employees, the infrastructure, the trucks, the processes, and, and that is the heart of one of these businesses. So yes, you can uh, operate one of these businesses by going to FedEx and applying through Build a Ground Biz, going in, uh, doing an AIM meeting, becoming approved, and then you're going to start building the business around what FedEx gives you from a contracted CSA perspective. It is a much tougher road to hoe, uh, but it is certainly something that people do. Yeah. And it, what I tell people all the time on that is that it is free to purchase, but there is a cost. <laughs> uh, you have to hire all of your drivers, get all of your trucks very quickly. And that can be really difficult to go from zero to, you know, if you're taking over a 10 route business from p and that's, you know, usually 12 to 15 drivers, 11 or 12 trucks that you have to do all at once. Uh, versus, you know, if you're taking over an existing business, there's a lot of kind of equity that you're inheriting from both the existing drivers and existing trucks, that it, it is very difficult. You also do not have any guidance from a previous seller as to what the territory looked like. You don't have any drivers with knowledge of the routes. There's a lot that you miss out on when you get it for free. And I've seen really, really difficult roads from, from people who've come in through that route. So often what we recommend to people is that is a that is a, a perfectly fine way to get you know a second or third business. But typically, I would recommend your first business be something that is already operated really well and you pay a good price for it versus you know something that's free and you kind of inherit a lot of issues from the beginning. And I'll say, Josh, just to add a little bit to that, FedEx doesn't give you a grace period. You do not have a, a two or three month runway to get up to speed, quote unquote. Um, you come in day one and if you don't understand how to code packages and you don't have a driving staff that knows how to do the job they're supposed to do, FedEx is not going to look very favorably on your performance. And so just know if you do decide to go that route, you don't get a, a, a period to learn the business. And so that makes it very challenging. And one of the things when you buy an existing business with an infrastructure in place is, is you're acquiring processes. You're acquiring a group of people who are operating processes that they know how to do pro appropriately for FedEx. So, um, and the fleet as well too. So just don't underestimate how hard it is to start one of these businesses from zero. It's, it's really difficult. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the last part of the question from Katina is what type of corporation do you need? Uh, and that's just a, it either is a C corporation or an S corporation. Those are the only ones that are allowed. You can't do an LLC. So that's just, that's a FedEx requirement. Those are the only two you can have there. Um, this question from Susanna, uh, based, so her book, she doesn't have any book right now. I don't know if she's saying that she doesn't have any books at all or that she's read every book she has. Either one would be pretty impressive. Um, the So question is just, I want to know more about the four pillars. We're looking into more about acquiring a route. And basically what I tell you, we do have a free course that's just kind of some high level things on our website, a 101 course. But if you look in the chat and I mentioned it earlier, one of the next kind of steps, if you're really just trying to get a feel for the space is we have new investor summits that are designed as kind of a two day crash course and everything we can possibly teach you. And that the, the next one we have spots for is a virtual summit on December 27th and 28th. And there is a link to it in the chat. Um, if you already decided you're you're pursuing this space no matter what and you just need help getting there, that's when we point you more towards that white glove consulting that we were talking about earlier. But if you reach out to the team, info at routeconsultant.com or send anything in the chat, we'll make sure we get you information afterwards. All right. Um, now, Joe, uh, his book is Art of War by Sun Tzu. It's actually a book I have read, so I'll take that one. <laughs> uh, but uh, his question is, what are the potential problems if I am buying two carve out two carve outs under two separate corporations, or why would you even need to do two separate corporations? What are the what's kind of the thought process there? So, Josh, to make sure I understand the question. Uh, 
are we buying a we're setting up one corporation and buying a piece of two different corporations? I think Joe is has two yeah, so two different pieces of one business, so two carve outs that he's buying with two separate corporations. So I guess the for a quick explainer for anybody, why would you ever have two corporations if you're buying a business like this? Like what's the reason for that? And then are there is there any risk to having two different corporations or is that going to be fine? Well, it depends first on whether it's line hall or P&D. And so uh, I presume the question is, is around P&D um, and gets back to Josh's scale question, where if you have one corporation and you're buying part of a, of a carve out or any business, you're going to come up against that, that scale threshold limit internally if the business is too big. And, and that is relative to the size of the terminal and the size of the business you're buying. So if, if the goal is to have a larger organization, but to do it in two pieces, then in theory, you can set up a second, second corporation, but you cannot be the authorized officer of two corporations in one terminal. So you would need to find a partner to come to the table with you, and you can both be shareholders in each other's corporations, but you would need to be separate authorized officers for FedEx's perspective. And whether or not they'll let a husband and wife or a father or son, it varies by terminal. So sometimes you can even do a husband and wife with two separate corporations, but you really need to make sure that the terminal is on board with that before you start going down that path. Yeah. And the, the thing to kind of think through as to why they don't allow it is scale is all a risk factor for FedEx. So, you know, if somebody's too big of a percentage of the terminal and they fail, it'll seriously impact the terminal. So that's why they have scale limits. And it's also why they don't want, they often don't want a husband and wife to have two different corporations to get above that scale limit because often they, you know, FedEx will view you as the same risk profile, but sometimes you can get around that. Sometimes, you know, if you have if there's a story you can tell, or depending on the terminal manager, you can kind of explain how your your assets or you like, you know, if one fails, the other one. There's sometimes that you can tell that story in a way that terminals will agree to. But like Butch said, I would not go very far down that path if the terminal has not answered the question on whether or not they would approve it. Because what is the worst, and we, we do see all the time, especially when they're not working through us um, to buy a business, is... You know, they'll say, yeah, I'm buying it with my husband. It's going to be great. The broker said it was going to be great. And they get all the way up to, you know, very close to stand up sometimes even. And then they, they get told, hey, you know, you can't buy this unless you find a partner that's not your husband. Um, and that does happen. And it's and then, you know, you, you lose six months of time trying to figure out what to do next. And I'm not seeing the question, Josh, but there is a world where you set up one corporation to buy parts of two other businesses. And that's very easily done. And we've done that a lot. So say two contractors may have five or six zip codes each, and, and a couple of those zip codes are contiguous with each other. There is a world where you can buy a, a couple zip codes from two different contractors in one business of your own as well, too, as long as the new CSA that you're proposing is contiguous. Yeah, that's right. Uh, next one here from Spencer. Uh, his book is War and Peace. That is very understandable. It's like one of the biggest books that <laughs> exist. I also have never even attempted that book. Um, so does FedEx allow buying and selling of line haul only businesses in November and December? You can definitely transact in the line haul space in November and December. Again, FedEx has all the authority to approve who and when. And so there's no guarantee that you can do it, but they will let those transactions occur. Whereas it is extremely rare for something to occur in the P&D side in November and December, unless a contractor is failing miserably and FedEx needs that change to occur. Yeah. It's very, it, it technically can happen in PND, but yeah, it's very rare. So we, we often say line haul is, is possible in November and December. PND is, uh, I, I, it'd be shocking if you did December. I, I have done a December 25th closing before though. So it's possible. <laughs> it is possible. I did one after Thanksgiving one year too. It, yeah. it is, but it's so rare. FedEx yeah. has to want it to happen. They do. Exactly right. Yeah. Um. Okay. So. This one is, there may not be a short answer to it, but just give a, you know, a, a little, at least an overview here. So from Tim, so his book is The Man I Knew by Gene Becker uh, about George H. Bush. Uh, and then, so what are the advantages and disadvantages of getting a deal to buy either new trucks or assuming the debt on current trucks? Um, so, and then, you know, he knows that if you assume debt, it'll lower the price, but is there any other negatives or positives of buying new versus assuming debt? So um, the first thing I'll say about fleet strategy is newer is always better. If you can, if you can do it, new trucks 
do a lot of things. Number one, they, they make your drivers very happy. And it sounds funny, but happy drivers is, is important. It makes your customer, FedEx, very happy to see shiny new operable trucks. And it makes your business run smoothly because you never have to worry about is there going to be a day when I come in and I've got oil leaking out of one of these trucks? Or is there a day when I come in and one of these trucks doesn't start? It allows the business to run more smoothly. It'll, and so every step of the way, having new trucks makes the business operate better. Even your repair and maintenance becomes much more routine, much more scheduled, oftentimes under warranty. And so newer trucks, newer equipment is a certain plus. Now, how you get that equipment is is you can be agnostic as to whether you pay cash for it or you take on the liability of the truck debt that is in an existing deal. Um, the benefit of using truck debt in structuring a deal is you can often avoid bank financing altogether. And so if the truck debt with a current contractor is, is assumable, then you can come in and put some cash into the deal. You can assume that truck debt, which takes the debt off the, of the contractor's balance sheet. And then oftentimes the third component can be a little bit of seller financing as well, too. So we do a lot of, of transactions without banks and the bank ends up being the lender for the truck debt. But the other pieces come together with buyer capital and a little bit of seller financing. So, yes, if truck debt's available, it's always good to look at. But you're going to have a shorter amortization if you assume that truck debt than you would if you structured a longer term SBA type deal and bought the, the business outright and had those trucks paid off over a 10 year period. So uh, your how you pay for your trucks is is important. But one thing I'll stress is the newer your trucks are in most situations, the better off you are. Yep. Yeah. And that's, that's in generally right. Yeah. And usually you'll often see, you know, valuations uh, reflecting that as well. So um, yeah, I think, I think also Tim, what I would say in general is that's also one of those things where it might be easier to, you know, dive deeper into the specifics of those actual, like looking at those trucks and having a conversation there instead of, I think everything Butch said is correct, but that's probably one of those things where it's like, let's let's talk about the actual two fleets you're looking at, the actual price, if we can talk through that. Um, all right. So um, Alan has a few here. So let's start with, um, you know, this is a, a question. Why do we see a lot of businesses that have been on sale for less than three or two years? Oftentimes in this space, what happens is, and it gets back to FedEx's scale requirements, is businesses have doubled in size over the last three years. And so imagine if you're a contractor and you have responsibility for operating in 10 zip codes, and that is a 12 route business in 2020. Well, as we approach 2023, that's probably a 22 route business now because the volume has just doubled in those 10 zip codes organically um, for all of the reasons that we talk about every week, e-commerce, growth, COVID, you name it. So you're responsible for all of the volume in your CSA. And suddenly over the course of a couple of years, your business has doubled or tripled in size in some instances. And that is operating a business that's 25 routes is much different than operating a business that's 12 routes. And so what a contractor will do is they'll say, look, I'm going to go ahead and package five of these zip codes in my current 10 zip code CSA, and I'm going to sell these five zip codes. And it allows a couple of things. One, it allows the contractor to raise some capital, um, which is always good. And, and we help, we try to encourage contractors to do that. Um, it helps them do things like invest in new opportunities and or new fleets. And it also right sizes their business to a point where it's comfortable for them to run it again. The other thing I'll point out is the bigger your business gets, the more under the microscope you find yourself with FedEx. And so that alone is oftentimes worth it for people to say, look, I just don't want FedEx breathing down my neck as bad as they are because I'm the biggest contractor in the terminal. So I'm going to go ahead and sell a few of my zip codes. And that leads to some of these businesses being for sale that really didn't even exist as a business by itself a year ago. Yeah. And you'll find a lot of people, just like we were talking about scale, they're like, you know, I'm not over scale, but I'm bigger than I want to be or bigger than I'm comfortable with FedEx seeing me as. So they they may sell off, but then they might buy at another terminal. So it doesn't mean that they've stopped their growth. It just means that they're looking at other paths to do so. Um, so there's, you know, there's all kinds of reasons, but that that is the biggest thing is just how much growth there's been. And a lot of contractors that just really don't want to be as large as they've become. Um, and then, you know, we don't have any, I wouldn't say hard numbers, but anything generally you can say around, you know, how often are people successful when they buy routes with us? 
oh, most of our most of our contractors are successful, particularly if you engage us on the front end to help you not only buy a healthy business, but know what you're getting into and be prepared to operate it. We have consulting services that go after stand up that help you from a profitability perspective, from an operational perspective, what happens when you first have your first accident. I mean, so the more you engage with people to help you, whether it's in this industry or any, the more successful you're going to be. So it's, you know, I'm not tooting our own horn as much as I'm saying, get the help that you need because it's a big investment that you're going to make and a lot of dollars and time is at risk. That's right. Yeah. It's a million, you know, million, multi-million dollar investment for some of these. There's, you know, there's no sense in going in blind. Um, now, this is the last question from Alan. Does FedEx have their own mechanics at the terminal? Um, and is, is it, and I think it probably leads to a general answer around what FedEx helps with. <laughs> um, no, FedEx is not responsible for maintaining and repairing your fleet. Um, and so, as a matter of fact, they won't let you do very much at the terminal, particularly if it involves fluids. You can change headlights, you can change parts of cars, but you can't do a lot of fluid exchanges in the terminal. They really frown upon that. And so that work is, is done offsite um, almost all the time. Sometimes contractors will have mechanics come into the terminal to do certain work. But again, it depends on what that work is as to what FedEx will let occur on site. Yeah, you'll find at just about every terminal, there's going to be a mechanic fairly close by because there's so many trucks that are coming out of the terminal that at some point, someone set up a shop close by because, you know, there's just so much business. Um, you'll also find that there are contractors who will bring mechanics onto their staff um, as basically, you know, somebody that they pay that also helps at least do light repairs on their vehicles. Um, the number one thing I would say is if you go that path, your mechanic also needs to be a driver. So they need to be a backup contingency driver. They can't just be a mechanic, but if they're basically a you know, a mechanic who helps on a lot of things helps prevent a lot of more serious um, repairs and also is there as an extra driver that can be really uh, a really successful way. And usually once you've gotten to about 12 to 15 routes, you can start looking at seeing if you want to bring a mechanic on. And if you get big enough, you can do some of your own work, too. I mean, I know a lot of large P&D contractors and, and line haul contractors who they have their own shops. They do their own maintenance and they just feel more comfortable with longevity of, of the work, what they're getting, the longevity of, of the fleet that it's going to help. And, and they'd rather make the margin employing an, an, a mechanic than, than have that margin go to somebody else with a mechanic shop. So this gives you a lot of flexibility. The bigger you get, the more you can do. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Uh, so the next one's from Walter Williams. The book is Viola Davis, Finding Me. Haven't read that one either. Um, so uh, well, I'll answer his second question first. So for, can a contractor own a line hall and p and The answer to that is yes. So that one is uh, definite. And I know a lot of people who own line hall and p and out of the same terminal. Yep. Um, there's some efficiencies of scale. You know, your P&D drivers can't drive line hall unless they have a CDL, but there is some efficiencies you can, um, you know, take advantage of there. But the, the bigger question here, let's let's see how you answer it, Butch. I'll, you know, you don't have to, we could probably talk for two hours about this, but what are the pros and cons of line haul versus p &D? Okay. I yeah. joke about this. Um, they're very different businesses. And I mean that seriously. We're here talking about both of them. But in reality, the biggest thing they have in common is they share a common customer. And that's about it, <laughs> because one of them is moving thousands of boxes in a neighborhood on a daily basis with non-CDL drivers where driver turnover is pretty high. There's a lot of activity on a daily basis, and it is it is like it is a lot of activity. The other is is moving tractor trailers uh, for FedEx overnight, and, and your drivers basically are, are going in to get a truck dispatched. They're dispatching, uh, doing their pre-trip and post-trip inspections, but they're driving a few hundred miles, dropping that trailer and bringing another trailer back. So they're very distinct and different businesses, um, and the skill sets needed to run each business is distinctly different. So if your skill set is hiring CDL licensed commercial driver's license individuals, then you're going to really want to look at line haul. But if that scares you, then then pick up and delivery is probably a better place to start. But don't think that they're the same business because they really are very different businesses. Yeah, that's there's plenty we can teach you about both of them. But if you lump them together and your head is the same, then you'll miss out on the pros and the cons of both, um, you know, because, you know, there are people who are really successful at line haul, people who are really successful at P&D, and they don't always overlap. The other thing I would say is, you know, if you're trying to figure out, I want to do both, where do I start? I have seen people be successful starting with either one and getting into the other. So I wouldn't let that necessarily be a limiter. And the one thing I would say too on line haul is, you know, sometimes people 
can't find the right line haul business because there just aren't as many. And so what I often you can kind of start with PD and get into line haul. Um, so sometimes that's an easier path if you can't find the right line haul, but there's still plenty of line haul. We can help teach you on it, help get you that fit. The other thing too, I would say on line haul, because the scale works a little bit differently, you can often find larger businesses. So if you're looking for something a little bit bigger than what you're seeing in a lot of PD, because there are often those smaller scale limits, sometimes you can find the, the bigger size entry level businesses in line haul versus PD. The other thing I'll say, Josh, is, is around the problems that occur in the business. On a daily basis in a pickup and delivery business, you're going to have what I'll call hiccups. You're going to have a missed pickup. You're going to have something that goes wrong. A package is coded wrong. You had to bring something back. It's very normal. When something goes wrong in your line haul business, it's not normal. <laughs> it means it means that you've lost a driver. It means that you've had a, a serious accident. And so the scale of the problems in line haul, when they occur, they're less frequent, but when they occur, they're more severe. Um, and so if your risk tolerance around dealing with those issues also may steer you as to whether or not you want, you prefer one or the other. That's absolutely right. Um, okay. So next one here is from David. Again, this is something we can uh, talk well, very high level here. So uh, his book is MF Revisited. I haven't read that either, um, but trying to decide FedEx versus Amazon pros and cons, things to think about for one versus the other. Okay, very uh, good question. Kind of different. With FedEx, there's a few things that are distinctly different than Amazon. One, with FedEx, you have a responsibility for a stated and, and everybody knows the geography. It's oftentimes a package or one zip code, but you're responsible for all of the volume that occurs in those series of zip codes. That gives you a lot of predictability around the size of your business. Um, that's not the case with Amazon. So the, the first big difference is with Amazon, there's not an exclusive territory that you're responsible for. On a weekly basis, Amazon lets you know where you're going to be servicing, how many trucks and drivers you will need to probably do that. And But it changes and varies dramatically. So you could be hiring people one day to cover the north side of Chicago and those suburbs. The next week, you're covering the south side of Chicago and those suburbs. And anybody who knows the geography of these cities knows that that can be a little bit challenging. So exclusivity around geography is the first high level. The second high level is who owns the vehicles. On the Amazon side, Amazon owns the trucks and pays for the gas. On the FedEx side, you own your trucks and you pay for your gas. Uh, those are probably the two biggest ones that I can that I want to point out here. Yeah, it, and there's lots of little things. What I would point people to is when I, you know, I mentioned we have a one-on-one course for Amazon or for FedEx. We have the same for Amazon as well. It's a really quick way to kind of get, help you understand high level, and then you can kind of go from there and look at individual listings. Um, I, other, one more joke, Fed, I'll, I'll tell on this one is it's really true. The biggest difference is FedEx is a logistics company trying to figure out technology. And Amazon is a technology company trying to figure out logistics. <laughs> and, and the technologies that are employed in the two businesses are very different. You'll see are, that as is, you go forward. Yeah. If you look at the two dashboards, if you've seen my ground biz versus the dashboards, Amazon contractors get, they're very different. <laughs> yeah. um, now, there, another question from Suzanne on the same point. Is the, is the approval process any different for Amazon? A little bit um, because there's a few more meetings and they are looking for a little bit different type of individual and, and to come in and operate the businesses. So, yes, it's a little bit different, but I will say it's not so different that you, you're going to need to be prepared adequately and equally for both processes, whichever one you decide to go down. Yeah, perfect. OK, well, I think we'll do one more question here. Um, so from Gary. So his book is The 80-20 Principle by Richard Koch. So is there, and you know, that one that one is a book I've been meaning to read and haven't read yet, uh, but any hinting from FedEx requiring contractors to have their fleet be electric or even a portion of their fleet be electric? Certainly not anytime in the near future. Um, and as a requirement, I, I think it would be quite some time before they required it. Um, FedEx ground terminals generally are not equipped with charging stations across the board right now. And so it would be relatively difficult to, to charge that fleet overnight. Um, and so I think we're years away. It, it would be wonderful. And ideally, we get to that point. But I, we're, we're, it's not a mandate. And I don't see it in the in the near future. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where FedEx definitely wants to move to electric, but it's not its not something that it's going to be like the next two years. And as those requirements start to come out, we'll, we'll get enough of a runway 
What I will say though, is it would be amazing if we could get more electric, if the infrastructure was there, because the idea of never having to deal with fluids again is one of the greatest things I can imagine for this space. Just take out a lot of those complexities that you see from the gas and diesel engines. But right now, yeah, even if you want, like there are some people who have got kind of convinced the terminal to put in some of the infrastructure for electric, but, and there are some electric companies that have essentially mobile charging stations that you can use. Um, but right now it's kind of the people willing to take those first steps and start to push it, but it's not coming necessarily from FedEx. It's more of something where FedEx would like to see it. And I think it may, it may even be 2030 or 2032, something like that, that is their goal to have a significant portion of their fleet be electric, but uh, we're not there yet. There's still some time there. And I think they would target a few markets, Josh. That's just supposition on my part, but I'm guessing you would see something like this start in California yeah, <laughs> where right. you had a lot of local support for it from your state government as well, too. And so they would probably start it yeah. in certain markets where they could get the support they needed to make it happen. Yeah. So right now, nothing like, you know, no firm push, but which is right. If we were going to, if I, if I was going to expect it anywhere, it's somewhere where there are lots of financial incentives already in place to have electric. So it's, that's probably what will happen. It'll be scaled like that regionally. Um, but that is all that we have time for today. So Butch, I really appreciate you being on here, coming and joining us, talk to the market, talk to buyers in the busy peak season. So thanks for having you. Thank you, Josh. Happy to do it. And, and anybody who's on here, if you want my contact information, reach out to Josh and Danielle. I'd be happy to follow up with any of y'all afterwards. Yeah, that's right. And then also, like, like I mentioned in the chat, there's links to um, the resources to go do those one-on-one -on -one courses or sign up for the summit and just reach out to the team if you have any questions on any of this. We're happy to kind of continue to talk through any of these questions you have if they're more specific or just, you know, you want to set up some separate time. Happy to do so. But other than that, thanks everybody for coming out today. I hope you have a great rest of the week. Thanks everyone.